This presentation was recorded at the Best Practices for Pollinators Summit. For more information, contact pollinatorfriendly.org. Today, um, but we're from the Xerces Society. We're a nonprofit. Uh, we focus on invertebrates and their habitats, and um, we are named for the, the little Xerces blue butterfly that you see there in the photo. Next slide. Um, and we outlined it a little bit, but Sarah and I are both partner biologists with NRCS, and um, I think there's oof, 10 or 12 of us now across the nation. I'm, I've got a map after this, uh, but we do a really wide variety of things. I feel like we all have a little bit different jobs, um, but we work anywhere from the field level, you know, helping with contracts or even just technical assistance outside of contracts with the Farm Bill. Um, we also help kind of more at the state or regional level where we're helping guide, you know, technical guidance or documents. Uh, it seems like all of us have been very busy training <laughs> NRCS staff um, as that staff has really grown in the last year or two. Um, uh, yeah, we love to do field days and get outside too. Um, so just a wide variety of things that we do. Next slide. Um, and we are, we're, we're growing, we're spreading, <laughs> we're getting there. Um, and we do have someone coming in the Southeast that's not on this slide yet. Um, so the, the Intermountain West is a little gap right now, but I just want to emphasize that wherever you are, um, if you've got pollinator habitat needs, please, you know, feel free to find your local Xerces partner biologist or other Xerces employee. Um, and even if we don't have a presence in your state, we'll, we'll try to help as much as we can. Next slide. Thank you. All right, let's get to the meat of it. <laughs> um, so rangelands are important for pollinators. Um, they create, they are these really, you know, vast connected habitats um, and high quality rangelands provide all of the habitat needs for pollinators. I'll have you click through, Sarah. Um, so I'm sure Heather talked about this. Um, you know, these pollinators really need flower sources throughout the year and diverse rangelands provide a variety of plants that can serve as pollen and nectar sources. Click. Um, additionally, for moths and butterflies and other and Lepidoptera, they need those larval host plants, um, you know, and some of which are, are really specific and some of those are actually, you know, rangeland endemic plants um, like grasses um, that some imperiled butterfly and moth species depend on. Um, also providing those undisturbed areas, um, right? So rangeland is not getting tilled up annually. It's a pretty undisturbed habitat when it comes to the soil. And often you also have, you know, really a lot of living biomass above ground for those stem nesting creatures, um, as well as these soil dwelling insects. I think that's the next circle. So they have places to overwinter and reproduce. Um, and here at Xerces, we really view ranchers as conservation partners in this work. Um, if, if ranching families can't make a profit and, and stay on the land, um, you know, there's a really high risk that that landscape is going to have a, a land use change um, and it, it gets tilled up and um, moved to things, grow crops like canola um, or natural gas development has been another big fragmenting um, thing in the Great Plains in the recent past. So maintaining those rangelands as is really viable, highly diverse places is, you know, it's in our best interest at Xerces and for our pollinators and uh, making sure ranchers um, can manage in a way that conserves biodiversity, but also supports their families and their communities is really important for us. Um, having said that, sometimes Forbes or wildflowers, I'll probably be interchanging those two terms, um, can kind of get a bad rap with ranchers. Um, I think uh, many ranchers really view grass, graminoids, um, as their forage. You know, that's what they think of as what their cow is eating. Um, and so those wildflowers or those forbs can be seen as competition, taking up space that otherwise could be filled with more grasses. Um, they might be viewed as noxious weeds. Um, 
and yeah, some of which may be, but most of them are not. Um, and they can also be thought to be toxic to livestock. Um, and a very small percentage of Forbes are, in fact, toxic to livestock. So that's not a um, completely ridiculous thought to have. Um, and I really love this photo. I think this is uh, annual sunflowers uh, somewhere in the Great Plains. And, you know, I think as a rancher who's maybe not not aware of what this plant might be or is, if you're looking at that and you're expecting that to be, you know, your forage for cattle in that pasture, that could be a little intimidating and you could kind of not really think about the grasses that are underneath those wildflowers. Next slide. Um, and, and so many producers, many ranchers um, across the Great Plains region and beyond um, often do aerial broadcast sprays of a broadleaf herbicide. Um, and they that's often an annual uh, event for many ranches. Um, tracking down the exact acreage of how much gets sprayed every year is, is really tricky, right? Because these are private lands. Uh, they're not required to report these types of things. Um, but I, I'm sure it's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of acres that are treated with herbicide every year in these places and spaces that are, you know, otherwise undisturbed and really great habitat. So um, that's pretty scary thought. And um, when you're thinking about biodiversity on the landscape, man, you're just bleeding biodiversity by spraying out all of those plants. Um, and it does really eliminate habitat for a lot of pollinators and wildlife um, if they don't have those, those flowers uh, around to, to feed on and, and use. Um, and one concept is that, you know, they're spending this money on herbicide and they're expecting to have increased grass forage to kind of make up for that cost. Um, there's been research out of Oklahoma and Nebraska that this just really isn't the case. You don't see increased primary productivity when you're doing these, um, when you're eliminating forbs from the landscape, your, your grass isn't responding with more biomass. And it also sort of um, has this assumption that your cattle are not eating forbs, right? That that is not a forage or it's not a valuable forage or it's not palatable for your livestock. Um, and so when we're thinking about how to turn this conversation around, you know, one of the things we really want to talk about is, are those forbs forage? And, you know, how do we find that out? Next slide. Yes. So as Ray just perfectly segued for me, before we even start to assess the forage quality of our forbs or wildflowers, we have to ask ourselves, are cattle actually eating forbs? It could be some of the most nutritious plants out there, but if they're not eating them, then that's you know not relevant to cattle or our ranchers. So yes, in fact, there is um, multiple research projects that have looked at this through the years. We have some projects dating back quite a ways that have looked at this question. Yes, cattle do eat forbs. As you can imagine, there's a lot of variables that um, impact how much of their diet is forbs versus graminoids or grasses. Are they grazing in the Great Plains or are they in the Mountain West? How are they managed? Are they rotationally grazed versus continuous season-long grazed? Um, is fire a part of the grazing regime? All of those management questions and strategies impact how much of how many forbs or how, how much forbs are consumed by cattle. But the overall point for the purposes of our presentation today are that yes, cows do eat forbs. So to kind of bring it home and summarize that research, Dr. Kevin Sedovic, our really um, close partner on this work, had done some research looking at this here in central North Dakota. And so to bring it to a regional example, he found that um, yes, Throughout the summer, cattle are eating about 75% graminoids or grasses, 25% forbs and shrubs. And again, he also looked at some management impacts and how that, how the different management regime, regimes impacted the ratios of forb versus grass consumption. But again, the general summary statement here is that yes, cattle are eating forbs. So now that we know that, we then turn to look at, all right, let's determine what's the forage value of these forbs. Like Ray said, our ranchers are such valuable conservation partners and we recognized that we really needed to get forage quality data to our ranchers to help them understand why they should even care about encouraging these forbs on their land. We have decades and decades of research of grass forage quality data. Um, again, kind of just feeding that idea that cattle eat grass. Forbes are of no consequence. So we really wanted to help fill that data gap. 
So back in 2021, we started this project. Again, critical partners couldn't have done it without NRCS and NDSU, Dr. Kevin said. We sat down and determined these three primary objectives. Number one, let's analyze the nutrient and mineral content of our common native rangeland forbs in the northern and central Great Plains. Then we want to create some regional forb guides that help ranchers recognize key forbs so that they can start to learn the difference between a noxious weed and a native forb. Um, and then also in those guides, relay the value that our forbs have to our rangelands, to our pollinators, and then also to their livestock. And then three, most critically, is disseminate that information to the relevant audiences, to our ranchers, to our land managers, and our NRCS staff of the Northern and Central Great Plains so that we can increase the understanding of the role that our rangeland forbs are playing in livestock health and performance. How did we decide which forbs to collect? We used three main criteria to guide our decisions. We wanted common, abundant, native rangeland forbs that were valuable to pollinators and that are thought to be palatable to cattle. I emphasize thought because as we all sat down to um, create these lists and worked with our partners and gleaned from their expertise, we realized, well, you know, we think that this forb is palatable to cattle, but we're actually not completely sure. So, uh, as Xerxes staff used our personal experience from tromping around on rangelands to start a list, and then certainly we would have been remiss to not reach out to the experts in each of our states to get their collective experiences as well. So our NRCS partners, um, our university research partners. Uh, so we combined all of that uh, many hours of tromping around on rangeland, we came up with some good lists, and then we also wanted to kind of check ourselves or ground truth these lists against um, a data set that is a long, long time, uh, long standing research project, the National Rangeland Inventory, so that we could say, you know, in my experience, I've seen a lot of dotted blazing star out on rangelands, but does the data that we've been collecting for years tell me that that's true or is that just my personal bias? Um, so we were able to then check those lists against the NRI data. And we knew from the outset that we wanted to do some phenological sampling, meaning, you know, sample throughout the growing season on each of these species so we could create growth curves like the one you see here on the left. This is a growth curve that ranchers, rangeland managers are really used to seeing for our grass species. Like I just said, we have decades worth of data on the forage quality of our native grasses and our introduced grasses. Uh, so we wanted to create something comparable for our native forbs. So that means we needed to collect um, three to four samples of each species at three to four different phenological samples. And the four uh, phenological growth stages that we chose, excuse me, were vegetative, meaning no flower stalk has been sent up yet, pre-flowering, so that plant has started to send up a stalk, flowering, that, that bud is open, flowering, and then seed set. And as you can imagine, this many samples is quite time consuming and becomes expensive to run analysis on in the lab. So our phenological sampling was primarily done in North Dakota where we had our primary funding from North Dakota NRCS. So 21 was our pilot year. We had more limited capacity to collect and a little bit more limited funding in this year. So we really focused our efforts um, on 15 species and we got three samples of each species from the eastern, central, and western portions of Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota. And again, because we had limited capacity to sample, we chose to just really focus in on one growth stage for this year, and that was the pre-flowering or flowering stage. And you might think, well, that's two growth stages, and it absolutely is, but we certainly realized um, as we got out in the field that we needed to create a little bit of flexibility within our protocol. Here's a perfect example. There's this stiff sunflower on the left, uh, we have one flower stalk that is open and flowering, and then we have others that are still in that pre-flowering budding stage. So we had to build in some flexibility into our protocol. And in 21, we had 141 samples total. In 22, we got um, some additional funding from NRCS, as Ray had mentioned, from the Central Tech Center. And so we were able to really expand our sampling this year. We collected 589 samples in 22 and added 60 more species. So not only did we get additional funding, but we got a lot of great 
partners a lot of NRCS field office staff, but then other nonprofit organizations, lots of partners from lots of different places to help collect these species. As you can imagine, collecting 60 more species is um, a big lift. So we had a lot of help. And again, that phenological sampling, so sampling throughout the growth, the growing uh, season was focused in North Dakota, but whenever possible, we were collecting more life stages um, wherever we could get them. In total, we added seven more states in 22, Minnesota, Montana, Colorado, Iowa, Oklahoma, California, and Kansas. And then in 23, uh, our sampling kind of narrowed back down. This was the year where we focused more on just building power within the data set, building more repetition, making that data more robust. Uh, so in 23, we collected 322 samples, primarily here in North Dakota. We did get a few in Minnesota, but by far and away, most of our 23 samples are from North Dakota. We assessed 12 species that had been sampled in previous years, again, building that power and repetition within the data set. Um, and also this data is still coming in from the lab. So just wanted to make clear that from here on out, the only 23 data, 2023 data that is included in the slides is the nutritional data that Ray's going to talk about in a minute. Our mineral data, we still haven't gotten um, analyzed yet. We just got it back from the lab. So this is all preliminary results that you will see in the coming slides. And here, I just wanted to show a nice map of our sampling effort. The darker the color, the more samples were collected in that county, just to give a nice visual of um, all of the different places that we sampled from. Right? Am I self-unmuted here? Okay, so. What did we measure? <laughs> um, <laughs> when I'm talking to a range audience, um, these are, you know, really generally known and accepted values. Um, so those kind of the top above the line are um, the nutritional or the forage quality components that we looked at. Um, and I'm, I'm going to walk you through some of those results. So um, crude protein, um, which you know, if you've ever tried to, to be gaining weight or adding muscle, you know that protein is a really vital component of a lot of metabolic processes, um, just vitally important for, for livestock. And um, one of the main measures that, you know, livestock producers are looking at when they're, we're talking about feed and thinking about feed. Um, the two fiber measures we won't look at directly, those are built in to that final component, the total digestible nutrients um, or TDN. Uh, so TDN is really a a measure of the net energy that an animal is getting from that livestock feed. So it takes that, that crude protein, which is critically important, and adds those fiber components, some of which are digestible, some of which aren't, um, to come up with the sort of net energy that an animal is getting from livestock feed. Um, so we'll look at crude protein uh, and TDN, and those tend to be the, the most common sort of values used when we're looking at the value of livestock feed for animals. When we're thinking about palatability and Forbes, um, I feel like there's been a lot of assumptions through time that, oh, maybe they're getting some macro or micro minerals, um, and that's why they eat those Forbes. And so we did want to investigate a pretty broad suite of minerals uh, to see what the levels were in those wildflowers. And so we had, um, I believe, 14 minerals that we identified uh, with our experts and with the lab staff, um, you know, as in important minerals for livestock um, growth, reproduction, immunity, um, and thank goodness, Sarah, <laughs> will be um, walking through some of those results with you. I believe we picked out five that are really crucial macro and micro nutrients um, that she's gonna walk you through. So these next slides are, there are a lot. <laughs> um, as we were kind of outlining that data, I hope it became really clear that this is, is a pretty large and complex data set. Um, so here we've got all of the species that we sampled, uh, I think it's 72 or 75, um, somewhere in those numbers, and those are the common names there. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not super concerned that you're looking at any one particular species here. What I really want you to see is, you know, the breadth of the this data set. Um, and I will say that the level of repetition for each of these species is highly variable. So I think we had 
like 43 replications for one, like that was the, the most number of replications we had down to species where we really only had one, one or two samples. Um, so you can see the standard error bars there too. Um, so we've got all our, our common names, all of our species, um, and then we've got the mean crude protein percent along the bottom. The dotted line there is the minimum requirement for crude protein for a 1,200 pound lactating cow, which is about 9.8%. Um, and then Autumn, um, Dr. Smart was able to layer these colors onto the values uh, that we pulled from um, a hay analysis. So sort of um, levels of crude protein that you would see in a typical grass hay mixture, um, a legume hay, which is generally considered a more high quality hay or you know a, a low crude protein hay. Um, and as you can see from the graph, you know, many of our species are meeting the minimum crude protein requirement, you know, 75% are meeting that minimum requirement. And many species are um, showing crude protein values in line uh, with a high quality legume hay. Um, so I think this is really just a, a nice, broad first step um, to show our producers that in fact, these, these plants are providing um, crude protein for your animals. Next slide. And some of this was um, a, a little bit unsurprising. Um, I think anecdotally in the literature, legumes, you know, we, we know those have high levels of crude protein um, because of their relationships with soil microbes um, and, and their plant anatomy. So we weren't too surprised by some of these legumes and I just have laid out five of them here um, and you can kind of see the growth stage along the bottom line there um, and then we've got the crude protein percentage um, and we did include some crude protein values for I apologize if you hear my dog barking um, a warm season grass which is common in the region little blue stem um, as well as a cool season grass uh, needle and thread um, and those values are pulled from um, Goodmanson Ranch in the Sand Hills of Nebraska, um, but are pretty much in line with the values you would see for crude protein for, you know, warm season and cool season grasses throughout the region. Um, and you can see from those grass lines, the blue and the red lines, um, you know, grasses are a, a pretty high in the vegetative stage and then just gradually decline um, through through their life cycle. Um, and some of this has been really interesting to see that, you know, some of our plants are not showing that pattern, um, like purple prairie clover is actually increasing at the pre-flowering from what it was vegetatively and then declining. Um, but you can see that these are, you know, above those grass values. Next slide. But other things, excuse me, were pretty surprising to us. <laughs> there has been um, some research out of Nebraska um, from um, Tim Dixon uh, of showing that cattle do uh, feed on milkweed and um, in some cases prefer to eat parts of milkweed plants. Um, but I think that was, there's still pretty new data and there's definitely some assumptions um, held about milkweed uh, in, in the ranching community that you know, milkweeds are toxic and or cattle don't eat them or if they eat them, they, you know, they're going to be poisoned. Um, so the milkweeds that we investigated here um, were common in showy milkweed, which are two common milkweeds in the northern and central Great Plains, um, which are, have very low toxicity levels. They're not toxic to cattle um, and are showing, you know, pretty high values of crude protein um, throughout their life stages. Um, Scarlet globe mallow is a uh, more of a Western Great Plains plant. That's uh, it's got some interesting values in other categories too. I don't know what's going on with scarlet globe mallow, and it's one that some experts said, "Oh yeah, I've seen cows eat scarlet globe mallow," and other experts said, "No, I've never seen a cow eat scarlet globe mallow." So, um, just some it brings up a lot more questions, definitely, for some of these species, and really nice to see that. Um, you know, these non-legume species are also providing crude protein. Next slide, please. Okay, so that was our crude protein data um, that we're going to share. And now we want to move on to the total digestible nutrients. So kind of the same um, format again here with all of our species. And then we've got that TDN percentage along the bottom. Uh, again, the gray dotted line is our minimum requirement and the colors overlaid are sort of a range of values with green being really excellent TDN values, um, yellow being good and gray being sort of medium. Um, so you can see that these plants are really knocking it out of the park when it comes to TDN. Um, 
when we spoke with a cattle nutritionist and showed him some of this data, he wasn't super surprised at a lot of the crude protein. Um, he, he kind of thought, oh, yes, probably many of these forbs and wildflowers have high levels of crude protein. Um, but he was shocked when he saw the total digestible nutrients. Um, I think he, he assumed and others, I mean, it's been kind of a, a common conception that, you know, even if they had high crude protein, they probably had a lot of indigestible fiber, which would drive this TDN or net energy that the animal is getting from this forage down. Um, but what we're seeing is that's just not the case, right? Um, they aren't, if there's not really high levels of indigestible fiber, they're still providing a lot of net energy um, to the animal and are a valuable forage source. Next slide. So we'll look at um, these next two slides are the wildest, so stick with me. <laughs> um, so these are our top 20 plants for TDN, um, and this is uh, across the gr different growth stages. And so again, we've got the, the cool season and warm season um, grasses also plotted on there with their TDN percentages. Um, and I like to show this slide because, you know, A, many of these are performing above our native grasses. And you'll note that the minimum, the dashed minimum requirement line uh, that our, our native grasses are providing adequate levels of TDN early in the season. Um, but as they move through their growth stages, they are not, they're not an adequate forage to provide TDN um, for these livestock. Um, and I also think this gives you a nice graph of sort of like the differences in what's happening throughout the life stages of some of these plants and also shows you some of the variability in this data. Um, you know, many of these species, we only had one, one growth stage uh, collected for them um, and others where we have a more complete picture. Um, but they're, you know, all providing above that minimum requirement for TDN for energy for livestock. Next slide. Okay, this is <laughs> TDN again, and this is grouped by family. So all of the plant families that we collected um, uh, and really similar grass lines. Um, the gray cloud is uh, our complete data set. So those are all of our data points. And then the black dots are the families, um, all the species within that plant family uh, with a trend line through them. Um, the reason why I wanted to pull this out distinctly from the other graphs is um, along the x-axis there, we actually have date instead of growth stage. So um, the first first one is June 1 to September 1. Um, and I really, I really love that <laughs> because it shows you, um, even just looking at the gray mass of dots, right? Um, there's something that has really high TDN uh, throughout the entire season from June 1 to September 1 and beyond um, out there for livestock if you've got this diversity of plants on the landscape. Um, and I also really like how some of the families are maintaining such high values of TDN, even really late in the season when our native grasses are really not good forage um, for animals at that time. And I, I think that's all of the forage or the nutrition forage quality data that I'm gonna show you today. Um, and so now H Sarah Hamilton Buxton is going to um, go over some of the mineral mineral results that we saw as well. Thank you, Ray. Uh, so as Ray mentioned, we have sample we have data on fourteen minerals, so that gets really complex and a bit mind boggling, and also really lengthy and boring. So we're going to focus on just the five minerals that we typically talk about um, when it comes to livestock. The ones we're most familiar with would be calcium, potassium, phosphorus zinc and copper. Now, before I dive in too much here, I do want to say that just as human nutrition is a really complex subject, livestock nutrition is as well. And just because a plant has a high content of, say, copper, that doesn't necessarily mean that all of the copper that that animal consumes would be available to them because there's antagonistic relationships. So if they have a lot of molybdenum in their diet as well, the molybdenum binds with copper and the gut and it doesn't make it available to the animal. So it's a really complex subject that again, we will not get into, but just understand a lot of complexity involved here. Um, but our summary statement that we can take away and, and give as a good take home is that Forbes are providing high levels of minerals that are needed for livestock growth and reproduction. Now, that being said, I do want to emphasize that we are by no means are saying that, hey, if you have these forbs out on your rangeland, then ranchers can do away with their mineral supplementation program. That's not true at all. We would never recommend that. Um, 
what we are saying is that, hey, these forbs are providing um, more minerals than we previously appreciated. They do have a role to play in livestock diet and health and performance. Um, so looking specifically at calcium and potassium, in many of the species that we sampled, calcium and potassium contents exceeded the minimum requirements needed for a 1,200 pound lactating cow. And in a lot of cases, um, the calcium and potassium contents in our forbs were higher than in our native grass community. So I would like to dig a little bit deeper into the remaining three minerals I just mentioned, phosphorus, copper, and zinc. Um, so again, these are similar to what Ray just showed you, but I wanna walk you through it. So we have growth stage on the x-axis. We have um, phosphorus on the phosphorus content on the y-axis. Our dotted horizontal gray line there is showing the minimum requirements for a 1200 pound lactating cow when it comes to phosphorus. And then on this slide, we have um, the, all of the data that we collected in 2021 and 2022 summarized by plant family. So you'll see plant family name in the gray bar at the top of each of these graphs. Um, and then the forbs uh, are graphed in black and then little blue stem is in blue, is in red and needle and thread is in blue. So as you can see, just as a quick takeaway from these graphs, our forbs are offering a high amount of phosphorus. Now, phosphorus is really important to um, a lot of metabolic processes in livestock. However, phosphorus worldwide is generally deficient in our grassland forage. So we expected phosphorus to come in low and sure enough, little blue stem and needle and thread is showing that story here. They are um, consistently below that minimum requirement line. But our forbs, in some cases, uh, as you can see, like in these top two rows, are exceeding the minimum requirements or are adequate, providing adequate levels of phosphorus. Um, and then certainly there are some forbs that are more comparable to our native grasses. Um, so that is a summary of all of the data collected. But here I wanted to zoom in for more of a species specific level because I think it's just a lot easier to have some takeaways when we're talking about species rather than plant families. Um, so common milkweed was one that had high phosphorus content, uh, certainly exceeded the minimum requirements needed for a 1200 pound lactating cow and then drops off sharply as it matures and sets seed. And as Ray mentioned, a lot of times that's, that's what we typically expect to see. Forage quality and mineral content would drop off as the plant matures. Um, so that was the case, American licorice, again, exceeding the minimum requirements needed for phosphorus, but then dropping off as the plant matures. Upright prairie coneflower, you might know that as yellow coneflower, really bounced along right at that adequate level. Um, but all of these are above our native grass community. So they're filling a niche in livestock diet that our grasses aren't. Um, but certainly not all species. You can see getting down here to dotted blazing star, stiff goldenrod is certainly more comparable to our native grasses. Copper. Copper is a really important trace mineral um, to immune health. If a cow is low in copper, she's obviously going to get more sick. Uh, and this would certainly affect her reproductive performance. Uh, breed, a rancher might see breed back dropping in his herd if he, his herd is low on copper. Um, which ultimately affects his calf crop and his bottom line. So copper is an important trace mineral to make sure um, cows are meeting their minimum requirements. And like phosphorus, it is perpetually um, deficient. Now, copper might not be deficient worldwide like phosphorus, but it is deficient in the northern Great Plains. As you can see here by the grass um, lines, the little blue stem and the needle and thread, it is pretty darn near zero. Um, however, in our forbs, we do have higher levels of copper than we do in our native grasses. So again, this is that plant kind of, uh, this is the data summarized by plant family for all of our samples in 21 and 22. And the big takeaway I wanted to have here is that all of the forbs were higher uh, in copper content than our native grasses. Some were exceeding the minimum requirements. Some were right at that line. And then certainly there's some down here that fall below, but all of them are providing more copper than our native grasses. To zoom into that species level again, uh, stiff sunflower does something that's so interesting 
it actually increases its copper content as it matures, which is not what we would expect to see. Um, so, so this could be a great source of copper for livestock. Native thistle is right at adequate and then falls below. Again, our upright prairie coneflower or yellow coneflower is right at that adequate line for copper as well. Um, Again, the big takeaway here is that all of our forbs are higher in copper content than our native grasses, not necessarily still meeting those minimum requirements. Again, we're not suggesting that um, if you have these species on your rangeland that you could do away with a mineral supplementation program. That's not, not the emphasis at all. Simply that our forbs are providing a niche um, and some minerals that our grasses are not. Zinc. Zinc is another um, important trace mineral, really important to reproductive health. So again, kind of uh, an important one for a rancher's bottom line. This is a slide summarizing all of the data by fa plant family. Um, and our forbs maybe don't shine as much in zinc as they have in some of the other slides that we've shown. There's some that are really a lot higher than our native grasses, but then pretty quickly they start to be comparable to our native grasses. Looking in at that species level here, stiff sunflower again is doing this really interesting thing of increasing as the plant matures in zinc content. Upright prairie coneflower um, also exceeding the minimum requirements needed for zinc um, and kind of comparable in that vegetative and pre-flowering stage to our grasses, but then really takes off as our grasses start to fall off in zinc content, prairie coneflower is increasing. Um, so as you can see, like I said, our, our forbs pretty quickly start to be comparable to our native grasses, but an important thing that we wanted to show you again, because zinc is important to reproductive health and is a mineral that we're familiar with talking about a lot. So how do you take all of the complexities of this really uh, large data set and summarize it with a take home that um, is meaningful? And I think it's pretty simple. Uh, plant diversity is the critical outcome of land management. That is not a new idea. We've been talking about that for a long time. Um, but as this data just further can emphasize the role that Forbes are playing. Um, so we can take it one step further and say, hey, yeah, we do want plant diversity uh, out on our rangelands and not just in our grass communities and our warm and cool season native grasses, but also in our Forbes. Um, it's you know, a group of plants that we haven't spent too much time thinking about in past decades, but really does warrant our attention. Um, so we could take it one step further into an action item of, hey, don't spray out your forbs. Don't waste your time and money spraying out these forbs that are actually doing some good work for uh, your livestock's performance and health and diet. So a diverse forb community will provide more opportunities for livestock to meet their nutritional and mineral needs. And it certainly provides um, will increase the opportunity for pollinators to meet their habitat requirements for food and shelter. So next steps for this project would be to create uh, or to complete the regional forb guides, the field pocket guides um, in this summer, summer of 2024. We are certainly also working on getting scientific peer reviewed publications of this data set out. Um, South Dakota Grazing Land Coalition will be sampling this year in um, the growing season. And we're pursuing additional funding for further sampling in other states and looking for additional partnerships. Now, as those regional Forb guides become available, again, those will be field guides, um, thinking like a half page with each species highlighted on one page. Uh, that publication, once it's finished and published and out, will also be available on our Xerxes Rangeland website, which is um, given here at that last bullet but we are working on those guides with our partners. Um, so I'm sure it'll be available through our partners as well, NRCS being a main one there. Future questions. Uh, as y'all know, research projects sometimes, uh, oftentimes will conclude and we've just got a lot more questions to follow up after we've looked over that data. So some questions that we have right now would be, how does management impact the forage quality of these species, um, burning versus grazing, things like that. Uh, how does soil and moisture impact our forb forage quality, climate, um, and the impacts that it might have on the forb forage quality, livestock use, getting back at that question that we mentioned about palatability. We're not quite sure just how much, um, even if these plants are nutritious, 
how palatable they are to cattle. Uh, it's a great question that comes up a lot. Uh, so certainly warrants some further exploration. How do bison use these uh, plants versus cattle? What's the winter forage quality of these plants? And certainly another topic that um, always gleans interest is the anti-herbivory compounds and structures in these plants. We certainly wanted to um, acknowledge all of the field collections that have been done, all the people that put their boots on the ground to help pull off this really massive amount of work. Couldn't have done it without y'all. Um, and there's some folks who weren't even mentioned by name here, but just by organization, because there were so many people who really helped us out. And with that, we are happy to take any questions. Ray and I both have two US, uh, two email accounts. So that's why we've included both. It might look